Welcome to Science and Non-Duality. What is non-duality? The universal forces. It's the collective conscious. Being aware. Trauma is not the external event that happens. Trauma is the impact of that event, which is the disconnection from ourselves. That matter is energy. Energy is matter. That's what EMC squared is about. There's a language without nouns. There is a language without subjugation. There's a language without objectifying. But if it's recorded, then we there is a collapse. But if it's not, then it's the infinite potentiality. Welcome, welcome again to the Wisdom in Time of Crisis online event. This conversation today is with Merlin Sheldrake. He wrote this incredible book, Entangled Life. Let me read you his bio very briefly. Merlin is a fungal biologist and a writer. He received a PhD in tropical ecology from the University of Cambridge for his work on underground fungal networks in tropical forests in Panama. Based on the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, he's a musician and a keen fermenter, and Entangled Life is his first book. So welcome, Merlin. One thing I want to say, I met you, I had the honor to have dinner with you a few months ago, and it was such a joy and a pleasure to meet you as a human being, as a person. And so I'm honored to finally to have a chance to communicate with you again. One thing I have to, I have to tell you, separate from his work, I do beers. I'm a proud uh, beer maker, and uh, Merlin does rounds around me. He went, you want to say the story about the gravity cider that you made? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you liked that. That was great fun to do. Do you want me to, shall I, shall I explain? Briefly, yeah, because that's such, a, such an amazing story of, that defined the character of who you are as a person. Mm. Well, I mean, the idea, it was part of a bigger project, but the, the simple story is that I, um, I was told that in Cambridge there's a tree that grows in the botanical gardens and it grows outside the college, Trinity College, where Newton used to be um, when he was there and on the site of his old alchemical laboratory, in fact. And I was on a tour of the botanical gardens with the director who explained that this tree um, produced these Newton's apples. And I said, surely not these Newton's apples. And he said, well, actually, this tree was grown from a cutting from the very tree that grew outside Newton's family home where he grew up. And the tree that grows outside his family home is a very old tree and is old enough, in fact, to have been the tree that dropped the apple that inspired the theory of gravitation. But of course, this is just a story. And the director explained that it was unlikely that this story was true. Um, but this was most likely the tree that didn't drop the apple that inspired the theory of gravitation. And so I wanted to take this further. And I thought this was so funny because a tree's involvement in one of the most significant theoretical breakthroughs in the history of Western thought was being affirmed and denied at the same time. And so I went and collected these apples. Actually, I asked the director if I could take these apples and make cider from them. He, he told us that they were disgusting, that sour and bitter, he said, like Newton. Um, <laughs> and um, but if, if he said, absolutely not, I can't take the apples. He said, I can't take them because they have to be seen by the tourists to be falling from the tree, to add verisimilitude to the myth, um, which I thought was very funny and just made me want them more. So I went at night and I took them without permission, I'm afraid. But I used those to make this cider and the cider I called gravity. Uh, and it was delicious. <laughs> That's beautiful. I just want to introduce you with that to give an idea to our audience of, of the character. You're, you're a, a bright mind, eccentric, creative, that doesn't stop to anything in, in the desire to understand the truth. So I, I totally love it. And now let's get to your work, which has the same amount of ingenuity and, and intelligence and depth. So let's start from the beginning. When I talk about mushroom and fungi, is there a de let's define the, the, the names. What is the difference between a mushroom and a fungi? So a mushroom is just the fruiting body of a fungus. So imagine seeing an apple or a bunch of grapes growing out of the ground. And then imagine the vine or the tree that produced those fruits twisting along below the surface of the soil. So when you see a mushroom, it's the fruit poking up through the ground. And below the ground 
um, or in logs or in wherever the mushroom is growing out of, um, that, that medium it's growing out of, in there is the rest of the fungus. And most fungi live most of their lives as branching networks of, uh, called mycelium, branching networks of tubular cells, which is how they feed. So when you see a mushroom, you're looking at a fruit. Um, and lots of fungi don't produce mushrooms at all. Uh -huh. So mushrooms are mushrooms are what we see, but mushrooms are a very small part of fungal life. And and so, what is the role of the fungi in the soil? So it depends. I mean, we're talking about a kingdom of life here. So you know, there's animals, there's plants, there's fungi. Um, it's a broad and busy category, and so there are many many ways of being a fungus, uh, just as there are many ways of being an animal or a plant, and so their role can vary hugely. There are, there are fungi that live in soil. There are fungi that live in sulfurous sediments and at the bottom of the ocean. There are fungi that grow in coral reefs under the water. There are fungi that live on your skin. There are fungi that live in plant shoots and roots. So their roles are enormously diverse. And we don't know nearly as much as we should. The fungal kingdom is, is huge, but it's estimated that we only know, we've only described about 6% of fungal species. And wow. so we're just at the beginning of our exploration of this astonishing world. Um, and you know, this is, it's more diverse than the plant world, for sure. So, so the, the one that we seem to know a bit more is the, the relationship between the fungi and plants, right? It's something you describe in your book so mm -hmm. yumminess. Can you tell me more about the relationship about the plants and the fungi, this connection? It's fascinating. So what we, what we call plants are actually algae that have evolved to farm fungi and fungi that have evolved to farm algae. So when plants, the plants what we call plants are, are started off as algae living in water, in fresh water. And about 500 million years ago, they started to move onto the land. But the land brings with it all sorts of new challenges that they didn't face when they lived in the water. And so when they started to move onto land, washing up on these muddy shores of lakes and rivers, uh, they were just puddles of photosynthetic tissue. They didn't have shoots or roots or ability to support themselves. Um, they would dry out very easily. They couldn't explore this solid medium that they now grew on. So fungi are experts at exploring solid media and they're ranging deftly uh, through these soil micropores and digesting rock and all these complex challenges that the algae simply weren't able to do. But the algae had their superpower, the foundational superpower of plants, which is that they could eat light photosynthesis. So very early in the relationship, um, or very early in the evolution of plants, what we call plants, they struck up a relationship with fungi. And the fungi served as their root systems for 50 million years until plants evolved their own root systems. And so Today, we still have these relationships, and we call them mycorrhizal relationships. Myco from fun for fungus, and rhiza is the Greek for root. And almost all plants depend on these associations. And so plants supply their fungal partners with as much as 30% of their carbon budget, which is a huge amount. And uh, fungi supply plants with nutrients that they get from the soil and with water and they protect plants from disease. And this relationship is prolific. And, um, and we also have fungi that live in plant shoots and leaves as well. So plants are bristling with fungus and really wouldn't be able to do what they do without them. Um, and many traits that we actually think of as plant traits are fungal traits. There are more and more chemicals that we think plants produce. And we historically have said, oh, the you know, taxol or is produced by yew trees and is the basis of this blockbuster anti-cancer drug. And it later turns out that actually it's produced by a fungus that lives in the needles of the yew tree. And it seems that this is just going to keep happening. The story is going to keep happening as we realize more and more who lives where. Wow. So, 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 so the fungi are, re are really, they have a huge presence in our world. So they're very important and they have never been appreciated enough, I would say, right? There is not enough. Uh... 
what the world would what would the world be without fungi? It would be unrecognizable, that's for sure. I mean, we would not be existing in this way that we exist. Um, all recognizable life on land depends on plants, and plants. The history of plants is the history of relationships between algae and fungi. So that's just one way. Um, soil in new ecosystems is produced uh, by the weathering of rock, and the weathering of rock takes place by fungi either as lichens, which is a relationship between fungus and alga or bacteria, um, or fungi, um, mycorrhizal fungi. They burrow into solid rock using high pressure and, and re by releasing acids and, uh, and special chemicals that bind to minerals and rock. And they are responsible for a huge amount of soil production. And so this, the interface between these, the inanimate matter in rocks and the, the living soil, um, which we depend on for all our nourishment. So they're really, um, they're really at the base of these food chains that sustain all the life that sustains us. So I see two, two, two directions and then my brain is, is, is getting all excited by this. One is like, so, can you, so you mentioned in the book the wood world web. So this, this interconnectedness and the relationship between plant and fungi, is there a collaboration? Is there competition? How does it work? Tell me more about this symbiotic relationship. Go, go for there. So the mycorrhizal symbiosis that I describe, this exchange between plants and fungi that live in their roots, this is intricately managed. And both plants and fungi depend on each other, but both plants and fungi have to make sure that the other one is being a good partner, being, I mean, being in a, because it can slip into parasitism. You know, there's, this, there's this spectrum between mutually beneficial symbiosis and, and parasitism. And most of these relationships slide around on this spectrum. It's not like something's just a parasite or just a mutualist. You know, it's, it is this intricately managed relationship which, which hovers around a stable place. And because of that, they have to, they have to sense and respond to what the other is doing. Um, and this has to happen on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And we're just working out how this happens. It's still a big mystery how they're able to do this so sensitively. And um, so as they're exchanging things with each other, they're managing their relationship, they're managing their exchanges and, their, and their, the fluxes. But also these fungi uh, can connect to more than one plant because they're promiscuous. And so are plants. Plants are promiscuous as well and can connect to more than one fungal network. So what you end up having is these shared fungal networks. So one fungus connected to multiple plants and um, one plant connected to multiple fungi. And you can imagine in the forest that this can just keep going, these overlapping networks, these open and overlapping networks. And so this is the idea of the wood wide web, but these shared networks of fungal networks that connect different plants together. And the wood wide web is a term that is a catchy term and, and it's a, And it's a convenient term because we like to think about our networks and um, we like to see those mirrored in the world. Um, but it's maybe too convenient a term because it makes it seem as if these fungi are passive cables. You know, in, in the language of the internet, we have cables and routers. And in the Wood Wide Web analogy, the trees, the plants are the routers and the fungi are the cables. But in fact, fungi are far from being passive cables. And each link in this network is a fungus with a life of its own. And because the plants and the fungi are regulating intricately their exchanges and their dynamics, the fungus is regulating what passes in and out of itself. And depending on what comes in here, what goes out there, what's this plant doing here, what's this plant doing there, there's this very delicate um, regulation going on. And so I like to think of the, the Wood Wide Web as a good gateway concept, uh, but then I think we quickly move past this, you know, the, the internet analogies, the World Wide Web analogies, and, and it starts to become a much more, uh, much more interesting idea, really, because it embodies the very principle of ecology. Ecology is about the relationships between organisms, the relationships between organisms and other organisms, and the relationships between organisms 
and the place in which they live. It comes ecology. The word comes from oikos, the Greek word which means house, household, or dwelling place. So, the wood wide web, these connections between plants and the connections between fungi. This is there are literal connections between organisms here. So this is this is the principle of ecology in embodied form. And so I think it's a very helpful idea for us in thinking about connection in nature more generally, because. It's literal, and it's good for us. It's easy for us to get our minds around it because lots of connections in ecology aren't actual physical connections; they're moments of interaction. Think about a contact tracing app for mapping COVID nineteen. It plots a network based on short moments of interaction between people, but there's not a physical connection between these people. So, lots of ecology is like this, and it's hard to see those connections because they're moments. Passing moments of interaction, but the wood wide web; these are actual connections between organisms. So we can find our way in to these ecological ideas through the wood wide web, and I think it's very helpful like that. And so, so, but the fungi themselves, they have a separate uh, life, or they exist? Uh, how do you define? Can you pick up a fungi like picking up a glass of water from the ocean? It became the glass is still the ocean. What's the the relationship? <laughs> is there an individual fungi? In this network, it's very hard to think about individuality in, in fungal, you know, in the fungal world. Because if you just had one, say, say you take one fungal spore and you let it grow into a network, that's all very well. But you can take a bit of a network and it can grow into a whole new network. Um, it's like being able to take a tiny bit of your thumb and you can grow a whole new Maurizio. Um, And so stem cells turn into whole new organs, but it's, it's a whole new you, and not just a whole. And so they're, they're what we call totipotent. And so, they, so they've got this very fluid sense of individuality. And also, they are they have no fixed shape because they're constantly exploring their surroundings. They pour themselves. I like to say that they decant themselves into their surroundings. Uh, you can't tell you what shape a fungal network is without knowing where it's growing. They have no fixed body plan, unlike unlike us. And they have absolutely indeterminate. We call them bi biologically indeterminate. And so they're constantly exploring, unfolding themselves, branching, fusing. Um, they can fuse with other networks, and they can fuse with other parts of themselves. They withdraw over here. They thicken and fuse over here. They grow around this tree over here. They they reform their connection with this plant over here. Very fluid. And so what an individual is, is it's just very hard to answer, to answer this question. And this is partly why it's difficult to investigate these networks in the wild, in the field, because you pick up a bit of soil and you've broken its connection with the network. You can't cultivate many of these fungi without also cultivating the plants that they depend on, which means you've got to culti cultivate a sort of micro-ecosystem, and that's hard. So it's, um, it's tricky. You can't ask what shape a fungus is. You know, it's like asking what shape water is. And as an organism, in the book you say that is the biggest living organism on the planet, and, and also tell me about time and space. Is the biggest living organism a fungi? Yeah, so, so certainly one of the largest is a fungus that lives in Oregon, um, a honey fungus, which, which lives in, in plants. It, it kills plants, actually. And um, it stretches over you know, several hectares. And, but that's just one that's been investigated. And that's between 2,000 and 8,000 years old. And, I mean, it's, it's a serious serious organism and people have found this organism to be so large because they've investigated it and they, you go and you do te genetic tests to make sure that this part of the network is in fact the same as this part of the network the same individual but it means that the, you can't just stumble across one of these these networks by accident you have to do this testing to make sure that they're the same which means that there's almost certainly many larger ones that remain undiscovered mm -hmm. this is just what we know about you know how, much how And how big it is? How big is? The... Oh, it's I, 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 it's. I, how many? How many hectares is it? It's thirteen, thirteen hectares or something like that. <laughs>
um, as, as you say, since we can, it's, since it's difficult to detect, most likely there is somewhere in the world one of them which is like humongous. Totally. Like yeah. wow. Yeah. The so basically, in, in, so you're talking about fungi and, and plants, and what about fungi and animals? Let's go. I, the beautiful story of the zombie, the zombie uh, of the carpenter hand and the chicadas. I love the story that you mentioned in the book. They're so mm-hmm. fascinating and they're like reading a movie. Do you want to mm-hmm. tell me about the zombies? Mm-hmm. They are astonishing. I mean, it's just like a movie. It's, it's, weirder than, it's weirder than a movie. If I made a movie like that, then you'd think, you, you'd think it was some cheesy movie. You, would, <laughs> you wouldn't go and see it, probably. But, um, but it's amazing. So these, these, the Ophia cordyceps fungi, they infect, they need to infect an ant to complete their life cycle. So, because the fungus, from the fungal point of view, you know, it, it doesn't have a, a twitchy muscular body that can walk, bite and fly. It doesn't have the ability to move around like that. It can grow, but it can't go. And so, but animals, of course, can. And so these fungi have worked out a way to commandeer an animal body for a part of their life, to borrow an animal body, to hijack an animal body, to accomplish something which they couldn't accomplish by themselves. And in the case of the carpenter ants, it's to get up high. And once they're up high, they produce a fruiting body which releases spores, in which the spores can travel a long distance when they're released from a high place. It's a dispersal strategy. So they grow into ants and they grow around ants muscle fibers and they grow through the ants body and they uh, acquire an ability to control the ants behavior and no one's quite sure how they do this they grow around the ants muscles and they don't grow into the ants brain they, they there's a couple of options they seem to be able to produce cocktails of drugs that influence the ants behavior um, it's possible and that they cut the ant's body off from its brain. They interpose themselves between the ant's brain and their body and control their muscle contractions directly. And, <laughs> and, they, um, and they can control the ant with exquisite precision. These ants, you know, they, they, they bite onto a leaf just the right height and humidity to allow the fungus to fruit, which in, in the case of these carpenter ants is about 25 centimeters off the forest floor. Um, and the ant, uh, ants are oriented by the sun, so they're all in straight lines, and they bite in synchrony at noon. And it's just, it's, it's quite, um, it's quite unbelievable. And so then there are you know, different types of ants have different types of fungi. They have a very closely coupled relationship. Cicadas have them, spiders, caterpillars. This has evolved many times across the in- insect and fungal world. And with cicadas, they have it. They, they fly. There's a very distinctive flight pattern. You see that you see a cicada flying this way. You know it's infected. Um, the back half of its body is fall, fallen off. Um, the fungus is able to arrange their deterioration such that they can still fly, even though their body's falling apart, spouting fungal spores out of their back end, and a distinctive jerky flight which maximizes the spread of these spores. Um, it's quite amazing. And we know that this is ancient behavior. We know this is really ancient behavior because the, the bite marks that ants leave on the leaves, they are very distinctive, these bite marks. And fossilized leaves from 40 million years ago bear the signs of these ant bites, these death grips, they're called. And so that pushes the origins of this behavior back you know, over 40 million years ago. And it was, it was very similar to how it was today, 40 million years ago. But so we're talking an ancient ability here, very ancient ability. So now you start freaking me out because basically, and exciting me at the same time. So basically you say that mushroom can control living organisms very easily. They create an interface, they make them do whatever you want. And we have mushroom in our body. <laughs> Tell me more about the relationship between human body and mushroom. <laughs> A good question. So we don't have, to our knowledge, we don't, <laughs> we don't have fungi that control our behavior in that quite that same way. But it's turning up more and more research into the microbiome so that you know, this 
huge community of microbes that we have in our gut. There's a new field called neuromicrobiology, and neuromicrobiology investigates the way that the microbes that live in our gut control our behaviors. Many of these microbes produce neurotransmitters to interface with our nervous systems, and there have been really interesting studies where people have, so if you transplant the microbiome from de depressed humans into what are called germ-free mice, so mice with no microbiomes, then those mice start to show depressed behaviors. Mm -hmm. And um, if you transplant, if you have the timid mice strains and aggressive mouse strains, and if you swap their microbiota, then their trait, the behavioral traits also change. So this is just examples of these many ways that our microbes seem to be able to um, affect our behavior in ways that is quite unsettling because it makes the question of our agency and individuality into a question. And so there's a lot of unknown, there's a lot that's not known about this and exactly how it happens, but it's a fast growing field. And so these aren't these fungi, these aren't fungi like cordyceps where there's a, there's a straight, there's one type of fungus and it affects your body and it does make you do this. It's not that kind of neat one-to-one -one relationship, but we may not be, you know, these ants and these fungi may not be so exceptional at all. There are lots of examples of fungi or other microbes manipulating the behavior of their hosts, their animal hosts. And um, it's, you know, it's, a, it's evolutionarily common, one might say. So we may not be exceptions. As I say, it might be more our bacteria than our fungi that are doing this, but um, we, uh, we, we may be more uh, plural than singular, for sure, in our actions. Wow. So, so yeah, 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 yeah. So, wow. Because I'm, I'm thinking when you were talking, I was saying, well, the chicada doesn't know, or the hand, the carbon hand doesn't know that she has been money. She has been manipulated by the, by the fungi. And here we are. I mean, honestly, I take cardiceps and lion's mane in my coffee every morning. Now I'm like, <laughs> I have to be careful if I start wanting to climb on top of trees, I have to wonder about it. Wow. But it is interesting because the, we don't know exactly which chemicals that the ophiocordyceps are producing, which are changing the behavior, but we know that the ophiocordyceps is closely related to the ergot fungi from which LSD was derived. And these ergot alkaloids uh, seem to be produced by ophiocordyceps when it is in the bodies of insects. And so it's possible that some of these ergot alkaloids, which went on to give rise to LSD um, and which affect human behavior, um, these might have evolved in some cases in the Ophiocordyceps lineages to actually change insect behavior in this way. So it's possible that some of the chemicals that the fungus produces to control the insect do actually affect us, and we just don't know exactly how. And, and, and so now you mentioned, what's the relationship between LSD and fungi on the chemical level? Was there the relationship? So it was when Hoffman was, Albert Hoffman was working on the ergot fungi, as when he was working at Sandoz Labs in the 30s. And he was working on ergot fungi because an ergot fungi, they're a type of fungus that grows in cereal crops, in grains. And they've been, they're on the whole, they're thought of as poisonous because when you eat them, you get this terrible, um, it's, it's because of twitching and uh, the sense of unbearable burning. And people think that some of the paintings of Hieronymus Bosch describe the agonies of ergot poisoning, um, ergotism, convulsive ergotism. And some people think that also that the dancing manias that are described in, in Europe in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, where townspeople took to the streets and started dancing, so they died sometimes, that those might have been caused by collective poisoning from ergot fungi. Anyway, so these ergot, this, this have been known about for a while, and by midwives and herbwives particularly, because they're very, very useful obstetric drugs, because they can induce uterine contractions, but they can also uh, they shrink the blood vessels and they can stop postpartum bleeding. And of course, postpartum bleeding is a great source of mortality. And so these, were, these have been invaluable drugs and known about in um, herb, herb woman, herb wife law for a very long time. And for that reason, 
they were being investigated to produce new obstetric drugs at Sandoz Labs. So that's what Hoffman was working on. And he was working on this, and this knowledge had come from these long lines of these, these, um, these midwives. And so he was there looking for these drugs and isolating these chemicals, working through a series produced by these agar fungi. And one of them was um, lysergic acid. And I forget whether the there was one step removed. So he produced he produced a chemical which he then used. I think he produced lysergic acid from the ergot fungus, and then he made that into lysergic acid that you saw in night. And um, and it was just a, a routine, you know, work through them one by one. And then he left it, and he came back, and you know, the, the famous story. But but it's so that so, so now it's made when it's made, it's not made from ergot fungi, and um, but nonetheless, it has its origins in a fungal story. Uh -huh. And the, in your book, you mentioned something like the psilocybin is the magic mushroom, let's say. The, the, the ingredient does not work, does it not work for every living organism, am I correct? Only cert, is, certain, as you were said about the cordyceps, certain quality of the mushroom if ingested by a human being or by a dog or by an ant or by a rabbit, have a completely different uh, reaction? Is that... So I mean, well, we don't, we don't know enough about this. And this is, the, this is a problem for people who are trying to work out why it is that psilocybin evolved in the first place. Because the first mushroom producing psilocybin roughly 75 million years ago, and it's a long time before anything resembling a human came along. And and so it would evolve to presumably to influence animal behavior, but the way that it influences animal behavior, we're not sure because you know for humans it's non toxic for humans. So some people say, well, maybe it evolved to defend the mushrooms against fungivores that want to come and eat the mushroom. But then people say, well, there are lots of insects that live perfectly well on these mushrooms, uh, and lots of people who who take magic mushrooms would know about the, the famous mushroom gnats that live in the mushrooms. And there are clearly insects that aren't bothered by psilocybin. And so the idea that it's a deterrent is not, in its own, in itself, it's not enough to explain because it, it doesn't deter everything. So the, I mean, there's another side, which is that maybe it was a lure, maybe it was to attract insects. Um, and so it could have been both. So like death cap mushrooms, which are very poisonous to humans, but some insects can live with, in these mushrooms perfectly fine. And as a result, they have exclusive access to these mushrooms as a source of food. So psilocybin might be poisonous to some insects. It might be not poisonous to other insects. Um, and that relationship could change over time. So, um, but, but the effect of psilocybin on, on animals, on mammals, is it seems to for sure, there are lots of the poisonings reports from the American Mycological Association document a number of cases of people, dogs, um, eating magic mushrooms and appearing to become the mushrooms. And there's one account of a cat that repeatedly ate mushrooms and seemed to enjoy the effect. Um, so, what um, it seems like mammals have you noted know, it's not poisonous for mammals and, and it might even be pleasurable for non human mammals too. You were mentioning the study in the book of Robin Cartat Harris, the Beckley Foundation, about psilocybin, that, that beautiful realization about the excitement, the default mode network. You want to describe that, uh, how, how the psilocybin works uh, in the human well, brain? Yeah, well, it seems to work by, at least the, the, the idea is that it seems to work by disabling these high-level networks, which these strong priors they're known as these priors you can think of them as prior beliefs so what we our expectations um our habits are the 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 well-worn grooves of habits and our thoughts and minds that that keeps this sort of anarchic brain under control and if you take if you disable those school teacherly uh school teacherly networks, then you just have this chaos that erupts and connections form between hitherto unconnected parts of the brain. Uh, that's how it's, how it's described and personified sometimes. And 
it's um it seems to let the let cerebral activity off the leash somehow um what's interesting is that people a lot of people describe these mystical experiences which involve merging or fusing with a greater whole their sense of losing their sense of self um their well defended sense of self and becoming part of something more and um, and it's just an interesting twist in the story of fungi and fungal relationships because a lot of fungi have this fluid relationship with selfhood and and like with the insects and the fungi you know the, the insect is a fungus in ant clothing this is a fusion creature this is a co-creature um this is you know, the stuff of fairy tales you know, when you, one, you know, one creature turns into another or a sphinx or a griffin you know uh, with the paws of a lion and the wings of an eagle and, and but this is this is real this is biological reality and so these fantastical mythical possibilities actually aren't so fantastical and mythical at least they're fantastical but they're not mythical um or they could be mythical but they're also real but so so then it's interesting twist just thematically that that people have this experience this fungal chemical can blur the boundaries of people's sense of self um the, the sense of losing track of where you start and something else begins you know it's just it it mirrors beautifully these these other twists and turns in in the fungal kingdom where selfhood is something that's up for grabs <clears throat> it feels like uh, what you're describing is what you started the conversation with that in the in the plant kingdom there is this blur there is the not defined line of self there is no mushroom and plant and roots there is this interconnected ecology and uh, when human ingest uh, uh, the psilocybin all of a sudden they have these experiences of interconnectedness it seems the mushroom is giving us some hints about uh, a profound wisdom that if you look around is very deeply ingrained in the mystical tradition that we are all one somehow the, the separation of the body is just an illusion it mm-hmm. seems like so basically in your opinion what is the deepest wisdom the fungi are revealing to us about life our existence our culture our world what is the deepest wisdom of the fungi Well, there's different levels that the wisdom can be imparted on. So there's this experiential level where you, you know, a psychedelic experience enlisted by psilocybin, and this is well documented. And, um, and in that case, I think it's very interesting, this recurring theme of this losing the sense of clearly defined self. And, um, but then in the history of fungi, in the history of our study of fungi, there have been lots of instances, lots of interesting things that have come about. One of the really interesting things is with lichens, which and lichens are the symbiotic relationship between fungi and a photosynthetic organism, whether an alga or a bacteria, photosynthetic bacteria. But in the 19th century, lichens, and you'll have seen lichens, they grow on walls and cliffs and fence posts and pavements and trees. Uh, but they they're kind of neglected organisms you know um and in the 19th century someone came along and said that these organisms aren't actually one organism they're a fusion a mixture of a fungus and an alga and and they're dual organisms and he was laughed out of that house and he was a little preposterous because at the time there was only one way to think about the intimate sharing of bodily space and that meant disease or parasitism so how could you have a disease that was beneficial by definition you can't same with parasitism of course you can't there was no way to conceive of a mutually beneficial relationship an intimate sharing of bodily space like this so the more and then so this theory got tossed around a bit and and over the next few years people started to adopt it because it was evident when you looked at these organisms that that was what was going on and in a bit later on in the 1860s someone called Albert Frank the guy who coined the term mycorrhizal fungus he's a kind of symbiotic visionary he coined the word symbiosis to describe the living together of fungus and alga because he wanted he said a new word is needed because we have no word to describe the intimate sharing of bodily space that doesn't imply parasitism or disease we need a, a less biased word one that doesn't presume to judge the relationship before we know what it is 
And so symbiosis will describe the full range of possible interactions from parasitism on one hand to mutually beneficial on the other. And that term symbiosis was then generalized across the whole thing, uh, whole, whole life. Um, so fungi were these kind of gateway, fungi and fungal relationships were this gateway, const- gateway organisms to the idea of intimate cooperation in nature. And so I think that's a very big idea for us because we now have this word symbiosis, which is very valuable to us because before that we couldn't imagine. So we need these words and these words are useful work for us. And so that's one example of how the history of modern thought has been shaped by these organisms. And I think that's a piece of wisdom that we can, we've been lured into uncovering through our study of the fungal world. And through that, of course, there's many more things like this idea of, um, so lichens again, these these fusion organisms, these co-creatures, these, um, and they became these symbiotic icons. You know, they and it was through when people discovered um, these animals with um, photosynthetic synthetic bacteria living inside them. People called them animal lichens, and when people discovered that they had bacteria had viruses that live inside them, they called them micro lichens. So lichens became this this uh, biological principle. Um, so this is a this is a fungal relationship we're talking about. So and that's another level, um, and it's a similar idea to this to this psilocybin. This psilocybin mediated loss of sense of self. You know, our human idea of selfhood and our assumption of selfhood and individuality in other life forms, which is an assumption. We make this assumption based on our experience of the world, is actually not always a valid assumption. It may be useful for us sometimes going about our lives to think about things in terms of individuals, but in the biological world, it's actually not always a very helpful way to think about things. And if we relax those ideas, then we start to feel different. And that's what you have when someone takes psilocybin and the sense of self goes away. They might not be very useful, capable human in their everyday life if they don't have a self. We might need their self to go about our lives, but if you let go of that self, then you have this sense of myst- mystical experience and mystical connection with with the all, that which is greater. And and we need that too. So, um, so I think about this selfhood individuality question as one of the big things that funky leaders to question. so fascinating it feels like oh my god it's so fascinating you are opening the the the, the amount of possibilities to all the to and at, at any level from you're not talking about biology you're talking about philosophy you're talking about spirituality you're talking about ecology you're talking about uh, politics really you're talking about everything economy mm-hmm. it's so fascinating so for you personally what is your next uh, edge i mean your book it's here. It's fantastic. Really, really, it's fantastic. I mean, you are seeing this character. I mean, the book is your book. Is is you? Is is it such a representation of your brilliancy? What is the next question for you? What is the edge? <laughs> I'm really interested in. I discuss it in the book. This where fungal networks can conduct these pulses of electrical activity a bit like action potentials in our nerves. You know, we have our nerve cells and they, they're electrically excitable cells and waves of electrical activity can pass down our nerve cells and that's what gives rise to our behavior and our brain and our nervous systems as we think of them. And so it turns out that fungi and fungal networks, can they have long, tip-growing, electrically excitable cells which can conduct these waves of electrical activity along them. And this is only, this is discovered in the 90s, but very little work has taken place on this. There was one study in the 90s, and a, a couple of studies recently have picked it up again. But it's a huge area of um, 
of wide open questions. And I'd like to investigate this some more because it feels like it will be, um, it has the potential to change the way we think about lots of things. And um, and also because it's just, you hear about it, and the, I, the more I research this, the more I talk to the people who've done this research in the 90s, the more I realized that there were just so many open questions. And, you know, I just wanted to move towards those open questions. So that's one of the plans. I don't really know that much exactly what I'll be doing um, next, but that's one thing. Wow, this is fascinating. I want to ask you one more question to connect to our work of this event. It's not necessarily a continuum, but how would, you, how would you think fungi will deal with crisis? How do they deal with a crisis? What's the strategy? Good question. So, again, remember, this is a kingdom of life, and there are many ways to be a fungus. And so there's no one answer to this question. But for a certain, fungi have existed for... Uh, around a billion years, at least, probably longer. And that means that they've lived through all of the big extinction events that have taken place on this planet. And a lot of them will have gone extinct at these extinction events, but a lot of them have survived. So in some sense, fungi in the fungal kingdom are veteran survivors of ecological disruption and destruction. And these, these extinction events are dramatic calamities in the history of the planet. You know, these are huge disruptive moments. And, um, and in some cases, they seem to have thrived through these calamities. And the KT extinction, the one that got dispatched the dinosaurs, you know, the, the um, asteroid hits the Earth, the Gulf of Mexico spits out debris halfway to the moon winter for years and years. Um, dust clouds, fiery earth. I mean, just like a description of hell from, from a medieval text. And, um, and almost all the forests on the planet are wiped out in a moment because of the blocking of sunlight and you know, the debris. And so you have this global compost heap of all these rotting forests. And so these fungi that live on wood, they thrive. They have, they start booming. And, uh, because you have a giant compost heap and that's exactly what they need to survive. So there'll be some fungi that don't do so well in these circumstances. The fungi that need living plants to survive will be, have been hard hit. Um, but the fungi that want dead plants, those will be thriving. So in the case, the, the current situation, it's hard to know because some are, some will be, um, really hard. I mean, we're doing a lot of damage with our fertilization, with, you know, with huge, Nitrogen runoff, that's, that's disrupting the relationship between plants and their fungal partners. It's making it harder for them to regulate their uh, mutualistic exchange. Um, there are rain shifts that are happening where you know, um, plants are being forced to migrate and the fungi can't keep up with them. And there's um, out and out habitat destruction. I mean, there's all sorts of things that are making it difficult for fungi and for the organisms that they need to survive. Um, but on the whole, in the biggest, biggest picture, um, there'll be fungi that are just fine in the situation, um, more fine than, than animals, probably. So in a nutshell, you're saying that fungi have been, they created life on the earth. They, they basically, they, they help the algae to create soil, from the algae creating soil, they create the, the grass, and from there. So we're talking about a building block of our existence and has been disregarded, disregarded and disrespected for most of the time in humanity. So, and so what that brings to get another question about healing, the healing side of mushroom. Are we discovering some amazing qualities? Because it seems this mushroom are really kind of miraculous all around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's the yeah, it's, a, it's a big deal. Um, and of course, mushrooms have been used as medicines for thousands of years, uh, especially in China. And um, in the Shenong Ben Kao, this text of the Chinese medicine, there are descriptions of reishi, for example, which is a, one of the powerful medicinal mushrooms that we know of today, um, was venerated thousands of years ago, we think. And um, so there are funky metabolically ingenious. They can do lots of things chemically. They're, they're composers and decomposers of life. 
And in this process, they produce all these chemicals to regulate their encounters with the world that they are surrounded in. They have this intimate contact with their surroundings because they pour themselves into their surroundings in these networks. And they have to be able to deal with other fungi, with plants, with bacteria. They have bacteria living inside them and around them. Um, and they have to be chemically competent and best in their interactions. And, and as part of this process, they produce all these chemicals to regulate their immune systems, to regulate the immune systems of others, to um, poison others, to do whatever. And all of these metabolic compounds are potentially active in humans. And that's what we see when we have these powerful fungal anti-cancers, anti-cancer compounds, antivirals, um, antibiotics like penicillin which is a fungus's way of defending itself from bacteria, you know, it produces penicillin. When we use penicillin, we're rehousing a fungal cure in our own bodies. So that's, they're, they're, they're these metabolically ingenious organisms and they have a lot of curative potential for humans too because we suffer from many of the same problems. So it seems that everywhere you look as a biologist, everywhere you look at life, you f bump into fungi. There is no way around. Absolutely. I mean, and, and just to say, I mean, I'm talking all about fungi, but bacteria too and other microbes have been neglected and um, are very important. And, um, and fungi couldn't do what they do without bacteria. You know, they have bacteria living inside them. They have bacteria you know, surfing along the slimy layers on the outside of their cells. Um, they have all sorts of intimate relationships with bacteria. So we, we can't single out any kingdom of life as the, the most important but Certainly, fungi have been very neglected, and they are extremely important. Um, but I wouldn't like to, to say that they're more important than bacteria, because bacteria are also really important. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it's this question of um, being fair in, the, in our treatment of these organisms. And, and, um, but you're quite right that, you know, that they're, they are, you know, they've built or contributed play a huge part in building many of these ecosystems that we, we take for granted. And their role in the history of life is the, the history of life is inconceivable without these organisms. Um, wow. And we've neglected them. Is there something you would like to somehow wrap wrap the conversation, close the conversation, because we are getting closer to the time. Mm -hmm. Something that the something that you feel has not been presented about your work or your universe or <laughs> is there something that uh, that remains yeah i think that i mean one of the messages of my book and one of the things i think is really important is that thinking about fungi makes the world look different you know this is it's not just thinking about other organisms for the sake of thinking about other organisms although that's the case too you know, we should be curious we have a responsibility to be curious about the world that we live in and But it's more than that. So thinking about these organisms can change the way we think, and I think in a really helpful way. I think it can; these organisms can challenge some of our concepts that we take for granted, as we've discussed with individuality and selfhood, and loosen the grip of some of our certainties about how we think the world works. And I think in those situations, when we loosen the grip of our certainties, we start to be able to perceive more broadly, and we start to be able to imagine more freely, and we start to be able to notice more clearly what's going on around us and what we're actually doing and, and how we're relating to others, human or not human. And so I think of these organisms as a way of yeah, opening our minds. And um, I've found that they're very capable of doing so. Um, and so I wouldn't want to let that point slip. Wow, this is fantastic. Thank you, Merlin. So I just want to one more time mention your book, Entangled Lives. This is really, it's fascinating. The conversation we are having now is just a, in this hour has been probably a 5% of, what, of the stimulus you can get to your brain from this book. Yes, and as you said, it's just a way to see, see the world in a different way. It's not just to study another species. We are talking about how to improve how to improve, how to develop, our, how to envision our new world, which is the essence of, of this wisdom in time of crisis event that we are producing. So 
Thank you very much. It's been a joy and an honor. I look forward to meet you again in person and share one. I died to try one of your ciders and one of your beer. <laughs> I'm totally <Yeah>. dying. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks for having me. And thank you for listening to The Sounds of Sand. We invite you to explore more of our talks, dialogues, videos, articles, events, and offerings through our website, scienceandnonduality.com. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please consider becoming a member to access our massive library of SAND content, available exclusively to SAND members. And we would love it if you could leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google, and Spotify, and share this episode with your family, friends, and all sentient beings. Be well.